Jordan E. Franklin is a poet and educator from Brooklyn, New York. An alumna of Brooklyn College, she earned her MFA from Stony Brook, Southampton, where she served as a Turner Fellow. Her work has appeared in the Southampton Review, Breadcrumbs, Easy Paradise, Tinderbox Poetry Journal, Frontier, and elsewhere. She is the winner of the 2017 James Hurst Poetry Prize, offered by the North American Review, and a finalist for the 2019 Furious Flower Poetry Prize. Her first poetry collection, When the Signals Come Home, was selected by Pragita Sharma as the winner of the 2020 Gatewood Prize and was published by Switchback Books in March, 2021. Her chapbook, Boys in the Electric Age, was published by Tolson Books in August, 2021. Judge Pugitu Sharma writes about when the signals come home. The deep ferocity in these poems is rich, particularly in how the speaker manages to address racial inequity, the strife of sickness and death, and the necessity of naming the radicalized self in place, possession, poetry, and in song. When Jordan wrote to me to inquire about reading in our series, I was so blown away by her book, I read it in one sitting. I am so happy that today you will hear why. Please help me welcome Jordan Franklin. Mama Madness, Mama Madness, the radio, 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 stop. <laughs> In my head, buzzing, ripping across the surface, the synapse, the wires, gray gears churning, jutting out noise, actual sounds, voices, static, quiet, static. Hip hop, but I just saw the Bach Quartet, a third, no fourth movement. Molly's like a Rorschach test. The pitter patter of fine nonsense above the eyelids and below the matted crown. Flicker on, go the lights. One, two, three, four, louder perfection. Chris Clear stations fluttering. Bang, bang, bam, fuck. I am a radio on all stations, on at all times of day, never ending, never off, no. Quiet inside, must never be quiet. Static, quiet, static. Silence. Batteries expired. So, hey everyone. Um, <laughs> like um, like Jennifer said, I'm Jordan Franklin. It's so great to have you all here. Um, first off, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Sophia, and thank you for Hudson Valley Writer Center for having Writer Center for having me here. Um, it, it's an honor to be here, and like um. Please, if you're somebody who's new to the center, please like enjoy the cool programs. They got great workshops, open mics, everything galore. Just go for it. And also Jennifer is somebody who really supports the art. So you really, really definitely. So ah, sorry, I'm terrible at banter. So first things first, I'm gonna start by reading some poems from my chat book, Boys in Electric Age from um, Tolson Books. And oh yeah, I'm wearing their shirt. They also have shirts too, so yeah. And after that, I'm gonna go straight to the full length collection. Don't mind the post-its I do to keep track of the poems I'm gonna be reading because I'm that kind of person. I don't like writing in a book, but I'll like mark up a post-it, so. Um, this next poem is called Winter in America and it's for Gil Scott Heron. I raise the dust from your disc 
and praise how it cools my palms. Your offering ready to engorge speakers, this tomb of worn voice, savored, spun, repeated. On this disc, you are not a junkie or a warning label, but immortal. Heron is just heroin without the eye, and this vowel draws poison like a syringe. Bluesologists with those blue notes in black veins, you, a man in pieces, rasp. Here is my flesh, unto you my bottled blood, this devil at my door. So, um, a lot of my poems are inspired by music because, like, you know, I love music. And so this next one is called Tomboy Bop, and it's a form invented by Afa M. Weaver. And so the bop is basically this poem that has like these three big stanzas and these refrains in between each stanza. Where like, you know what, you state the problem, then you elaborate on the problem, then you offer a solution or maybe no resolution whatsoever. And so the refrain I took comes from this song called Cloud Busting by Kate Bush. Like, I really just love that song. So, Tomboy Bop. As a child, being a prince seemed wonderful. I love the way my brother's hand-me-down shirts left me curveless and how a controller's buttons pressed down as Sonic revved into a blur on screen. I welcomed dad's proud eyes as my hands bloomed into fists, just like he taught me. Just saying it could even make it happen. No matter how many fists I made, mom's cell hounds me while my brothers were spared its electric teeth. In high school, I was the ugly girl who exiled dresses and fended off older men within my fattened armor. I thought that down the acne constellations on my face, there was a star waiting for my wish to be womanless again with my hand-me-downs and games. Just saying it could even make it happen. Nowadays, I can be found in my fandom shirts, jeans, and sneakers on my commutes to work. I smother my curves in jackets. On subway cars, men ask how I deal with urges. At parks, they leer and flick their tongues. I am still not a prince. Just saying it could even make it happen. So luckily for me, this next poem from the chat book, it's in my head already. So I'm just gonna go for it. And um, so besides music, my poetry is often inspired by like movies and video games as well. Like, so this next one is called Multiverse of Madness in Technicolor. <laughs> Never been a pink girl, Sherlock. I gray aced all your tests, broke your Richter's and Kinsey's was so ultraviolet. I shattered your spectrums with my plectrum lips. I challenged Khan with purple pens at the stun, made Dormammu's dark knees writhe like fault lines when I roared. I pulled a Patrick Melrose and traded maternal instincts for an imagination that ran naked and green through the flat bush of my skull from the blackest of magic to pop fingers of Dr. Strange and Wong. Bolder than love, I bum rush Crayola out its box. If you ever wanted to catch the colors of a universe in your hands, baby, hold me. Now, I am shifting gears to the collection. And um, for those of you who don't know, um, a few years ago, my dad got sick and he was hospitalized. And like, you know, as a result of that, I had to be like become power of attorney and the healthcare proxy and stuff like that. And so while I was visiting my dad frequently, even throughout my MFA, I was both basically visiting my dad. Um, it made me realize that, like, you know, our relationship is kind of complicated. So Here's this book. I'm not going to dive into it because it's just there. I'm just going to go and start reading poems. And so like one of my favorite poems to start with 
is um, map of maladies because, you know, besides having a father who was sick, my mom also had cancer like in 2012. She's a cancer survivor. She's still here. She's up and running. My mom had cancer before that. So it's like that, like my 20s was filled with like parents being sick mainly. So this one is called map of maladies. 2011, kidney stones, a two inch tubes planted in mom. It's bleeding can wait for my hands and gauze to trap the red. She can wait on her side, voice fogged in unease. Me a step below tears as I work. I can wait under the loneliness of our bathroom light to rinse her blood off my fingers. Grief can wait for another year when the living room gives way to her news of cancer. Tears can wait over her body, heavy with new tubes, smeared in anesthesia and pain. The cancer can wait until chemotherapy wipes everything clean. I count her hair's loss to the tub's drain. She can wait to shave the rest as realization drags itself under the light. Beautiful. The word can wait on my tongue until she returns to life before me again. I can wait for the fast forward of 2014. Dad's now wheelchair bound, diabetic. We can wait for his bed sores, surgeries, hospitals circulating him between them like clots in his blood. He can wait until 2015 for the hopelessness, for his J baby, let me go. Heaven is a broken vein and it can't wait. So just a heads up, I'm going to probably be depressing a lot of y'all just so just heads up. I, I like being honest about that. I don't like depressing people, but apparently I'm very good at it. So, all right. So this next poem is called Waiting for Dinner at Warren Street. So like my bio said, I am a born and raised Brooklynite, born in 1990, love Brooklyn. I'm fascinated by how it's changing and I'm scared by how much it's changing, but it's still my home, you know? So I grew up in this brownstone on Warren Street. And so this poem, Waiting for Dinner at Warren Street, is self-explanatory. Dad's in the kitchen, singing into a spoon's head. In a boombox are the Mary Jane girls stacked above the stove's heat. Brooklyn outside the window in a night that redacts the sun. The bridge, green lit and dressed to the nines in stars, straddles the horizon. There are many pictures like this in my head of a man and his music held in the warm orange eye of our brownstone. Dad sings over dinner plates, his triumphant cry as the station switches to slave, then prince. This is the dad I'm not sure I've ever had. These pictures, their frames cracked like a radio that can still serenade me once a day. So I think I'm gonna deviate a bit, cause like um, for those of you who don't know, like I love writing golden shovels for some reason. Um, it's this poetic form like started by Terence Hayes, where the last word in each line spells out a poem or a line or a lyric from something else. And so um, I wrote this one called Rain, and it's after this poem by Tina Chang. I didn't spring from a tower of marble. The spoon fixed in my hand was sterling plastic. When the world spun on point amongst the stars, I stood still until the next chorus began on my block. I want to say this understanding of everything started inside my father. In that ruby christened cavern, I listened to his blood sing heard an echo of what rumbled and waited for me outside of that dark. The explosion of scents and color when the ax opened the gates of his skull. I want to say the fever that racked my father then was the beginning of my wisdom and that I heard it, 
heard it as clear and easy as the rain hit the windows. Okay, ah, so many poems. I wish I wrote more, but ah. So, trying to think about the next one, and I think the next one's gonna be um, this poem called Dancing With Myself. And for those of you who don't know, that's a Billy Idol song. You know, if I had the chance, I had to ask the world to dance cause dance it with myself. However, it's depressing, so head up, <laughs> heads up. Yeah. Right. Pops, a music man, princely disciple, radio patriarch with heavy hands and lips to sing Rick James or Jeffrey Osborne. Music surrounds him even those times he'd make you tremble like tunes in a piano's mouth. His living room a mess of straight spines and silence, and the only moves are your eyes rubber hosing in your head. The orange lights hum a warm motif overhead as Pop weighs belts in the back room, leather jitterbugging in his palms. You could only be threatened in song. 2017 now, and Pop's limbs have atrophied a tonal, their morphine metronome, tetraplegic time signature, bed sore beats. Pop's in a hospital courting diabetic bebop, your strange history caught in the hum of his chair's motor, his hands no longer a scale for leather. Even weakened, Pop still got a cruel solo. Don't dance. All right, so thank you all for being here. Um, I keep saying that, I'm sorry. I'm very, I think I'm terrible with banter. So a few more and then I'm going to get out of your hair. So um, this one is called Black Girls Rondo. Black Girls Rondo or the other side of writing or where they make you trade faces with the only other black writers for miles and their tongues slip into their names when they see you. Or where old Southerners say the word colored and nod to you, the only black face in the classroom or where it's assumed dad is in prison and not the hospital you mentioned time and time again. Or where professors advise you to learn the pastimes of the rich or where everyone's been to Cancun or Italy or Dizzy's Tunisia and all you can afford are subway rides to the Bronx to keep dad alive, or where you're called out for being one of two black funded students by your Asian peer. Count the hyphenated Americans on one hand here, or where not even cheese cubes and wine are enough to forget another black body was downed by police, or where you're told you don't write black or black enough or where you're reminded that before you are a poet, an artist, a woman, you are black, that albatross here to stay. Now, thank you, is the heavy stuff. So um, warning ahead of time, this poem references um, alcoholism and domestic violence and child abuse and like I said before, a lot of my poems are really inspired by music, and this poem is inspired by that Kendrick Lamar song, Swimming Pools Drink, which also is about alcoholism. So this one is called Dive, after Kendrick Lamar. Backstrokes for Carolina, where your old man broke bloodlines with shaking toe. Carolina, where his daddy drowned scents, ruled home with knuckles and gun, who made him practice kissing with a cooling barrel, whom your dad escaped in jungles with army knife and rebel smoke. Gramps with his whiskeyed new swings in a chromosome. When alcohol lurks in a room, you close your throat, for Gramps is in a cell somewhere, always thirsty. Now this one, um, it, once again, disclaimer, alcoholism, child abuse, domestic violence. Um, 
this poem was inspired by this prompt I received in this workshop I took with Tina Chang at the 92Y. Check out the 92Y, they got a lot of good programs. So, um, and the prompt was you have to write a persona poem from the perspective of someone you dislike. And even though I never met the band before, I heard a lot of like terrible stories about them growing up. So this poem is from the perspective of my paternal grandfather. Like quite a few poems reference him in the book. So this one's grandpa's poem. And like I said, disclaimer, alcoholism, child abuse, domestic violence, also a racial slur here and there, the N-word and the C-word. So grandpa's poem. Baby, I'm cack as they come. Blood hotter than a sunrise or hot sauce on catfish. Been cack since my granddaddy and his folks took back that plantation, knuckle by knuckle. And I tell that story whenever whiskey threaten my lips or I hear that old forehead scar of mine sing its love song for the rock that cracker drove into it. I never wanted to be a father. I prayed and prayed, but your grandma pushed out four boys. I took one look at them little black nug lugs and knew I had to beat men into them. As for your granny, she was all right. Too much lip though, a nurse in her suit that ran so white against the blues and yellows, I sang into her bones. <laughs> and your daddy, big mouth like his mama, Big enough to holster my gun into that night. Told your granny I was a backdoor man and why this course of a boy think he could talk like a man. I wish I could say I learned to keep my hands clean as a father, but I've never been one for lying. The bottle made me dance as well as sing. I danced all over my house. Worked my hands and feet into every surface I touched. I've always been an entertainer could send that one-eyed sammy davis nigga packing with his rats and get your grandma ups and leaves me i want to tell you the distance was enough to stop me but whiskey got a kick like a drunk and even when old cancer took my tongue from my mouth i still sing and sing and sing This is the last poem. I think I had this one there. I think I do. I've done it before. So this one and it's I'm probably pronouncing on a Bisidarian and everything, but I think I have it memorized. And um, like I said before, I was born and raised in Brooklyn. I um been in Versailles my whole life for the most part. And one thing you have to contend with when you live in Brooklyn is gentrification, you know, the changing of the city. And so I wrote this poem in response. Another thing is um, one of the parts of the poem is a lyric from Ziggy Stardust by David Bowie. So you'll know it when I get to it, I'm gonna sing it. So pardon your ears, but otherwise, thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Let me see if I memorize this one. I got this, I got this. Okay, so sometime in January, After the subway's keens rumble unbroken in cement, you will find sweetbreads, the curry of goats. Use every inch of the meat and eat them greens. The art of eating like reading and speaking didactic as kid after kid is pushed out of school. Electric running, humming, puff adder fluorescence and everything glows, or at least begs to glow and ponga la luz, mom hisses. The vigils with rattling cups sometimes. This city has so many languages. Schizophrenic she is. Your neighborhood's like a little Caribbean except with less sun and juice ain't a buck no more. Not like in my day. In my day, the can was law. Keep from the ledge, they drive for blood on the street. Some limp for green. A house of cardboards and blankets to hold doors when banks close and don't miss the bus. Not the one with every kid and their mama bursting through doors and newborn kittens run through yards and under cars. And you know that old wives tale where they steal your breaths as you sleep. 
generations fearing field line. Our post office is reason folks hate the government sometimes. Yo, hurry your ass up. Never booked quests or spotted the star man. Remember every face. Remember the thousand yard stare takes commuters sometimes and salmon fillets on the market to butter and bake and take that shop out of here organic now. Hell no, beef patty and cocoa bread, universal dialect of your youth from Christie's to Junction, womb to tomb. No offense to vegetables. You'll respect theirs, they respect yours, and newcomers know nothing about where they now call home. Wait for the condos and scatter like roaches when the raid like rent hikes and there'll be nowhere left in Brooklyn, your birthplace, your only home. How much xenon do their phones ejaculate when they take selfies and who put a Panda Express there? Someone wants you dead, retching the natural colors in your intestines and denial of birthright's a new fad, you know. You, Brooklyn born before the trend and too young to know how blue ruled this place and Ziggy played guitar. And after you stopped singing in your sleep, you woke to find him gone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. That was really wonderful. Such powerful, important poems. And really, a lot of them remind me of um, Beckett's Not I. Really, really great to hear you read again. Amanda Moore's debut collection of poetry requeening was selected for the 2020 National Poetry Series by Ocean Vong and published by HarperCollins Echo in October, 2021. Her poems have appeared in journals and anthologies, including Best New Poets, Ziziva, Cream City Review, and Mamas and Papas on the sublime and heartbreaking art of parenting. She is the recipient of several writing awards and fellowships and is poetry co-editor at Women's Voices for Change. She's a high school English teacher and lives by the beach in the Outer Sunset neighborhood of San Francisco with her husband and daughter. Engaging the matriarchal structure of the beehive, Moore explores the various roles a woman plays in the family, the home, and the world at large. Beyond the productivity and excess, the sweetness and sting, Requeening brings together poems of motherhood and daughterhood, an evolving relationship of care and tending, responsibility and joy, dependence and deep love. It is a special honor to have been able to invite Amanda Moore to read here today. Both of her wonderful chapbook manuscripts that make up Requeening were finalists in the SHP chapbook contest, and one of them was runner up. It was clear from reading her finely crafted, polished poems that they would soon be published together in a full-length collection. Everyone at HVWC and SHP was thrilled when less than a month later, Ocean Vong chose the full-length manuscript to win the National Poetry Series. And if that weren't enough, her book is now featured in the holiday issue of Oprah's Favorite Things, alongside Kevin Young, Tracy K. Smith, and Louise Glick. The O editors call Requeening a quietly profound work about the inevitable cycles of life. Please help me welcome Amanda Moore. Thank you so much. My heart is thrilling in my chest right now, Jordan. That reading was so amazing. Thank you for enlivening this Zoom space and bringing us that work. I'm so thrilled to be reading with you and to be reading with Kathleen as well. And thank you to Hudson Valley Writer Center that, you know, Jennifer, you've been a huge support, but also what a great resource for us. Um, the whole Writer Center has been during the pandemic. I took an amazing class in Latin American women's literature in deep, deep in the pandemic. And it was, I'm just really grateful for all that you are offering us. Um, I'm thrilled to, 
read from my book um, today. I always like to start with a B poem since indeed it is um, loosely arranged. The book is loosely arranged around the life cycle of a beehive or the life cycle of a bee. And there are several bee poems that anchor the collection throughout. Um, I'm gonna read one actually written. I switched my, I changed my mind since Jordan inspired me with her persona poems um, to read a persona poem, a poem that's actually written in the voice of a worker bee. Uh, which wasn't much of a stretch for me because it's a voice that feels pretty familiar to me as well. It's called The Worker. Each cell, tidy and tight with brood, what's mine now is sunshine and breeze, a gyre of pleasure and labor within. I can carry it all, crumb of flour, spittle and weight, apple tree, blueberry, what they need but don't want, gloved hand or swab from a crack in concrete, from weed and bombshell, I'll pull nectar and sweet, a surplus stacked neat and ready for plunder. My flight even is beauty and my chur in the air, the way I scatter beam and your attention. But I am tired of being the sting of closing the door in winter and sifting wing dust and limb out front comes spring. I am vain in a seething heart of heat, a single platelet pumped through the bright organ. Alone, I canker and peek. I don't want to be vengeance, to see in the world only what I might yet forget to lance. So I circle and comb, tend brood, carry out the dead, lead all our voices to thrum. Something I didn't notice and would never have suspected of myself um, until I pulled this collection together is how often I look at the animal world. I'm not known for being a huge animal lover, although I see some friends in the audience who, whose dogs I love. Um, but I did sort of find among the threads, and yes, Jennifer Dottie, I'm thinking of you, Dottie, the, the world's greatest book reviewer. Um, and there are animals throughout the collection. So I thought I would actually tease that thread a little bit today and read a few of the animal poems that intersect with some of the other poems about matriarchy and motherhood and daughterhood. Um, and this one comes from being at a poetry reading, not unlike this, um, where sometimes after a little while, my mind can wander and I start to hear things or make things up. So I, divorced from any relationship with animals, could not wrap my head around a poem about horses. So this is called, When I Hear Horses as Corsets. I imagine the great tethered body of my grandmother galloping through tawny fields beneath the last flames of a western sun and admire the poet who I think is decrying the corset for not being as fine or as real as the form beneath. More and more these days my eyes and ears collude to make the world more as I want it. I like this place where a team of corsets bends now to drink from the river and cool their sweat lathered satiny skins. When I catch on at last, the poet is nuzzling the neck of a real horse that pulls back its thick equine lips and fogs her hand with grainy breath. How magnificent, I think, to nuzzle instead a corset, to curl once more against my grandmother, take in the powdery exhalations of her body, run my fingertips across the bony spine of the hook and eye seam, press my cheek to the steely says. Hers is not a corset. I will saddle and ride away and it might not take an apple from my hand, but I'll fasten my small cart to it anyway. Um, sticking with both the life cycle idea um, and maybe introducing a little note of the illness and grief of the book. Um, I also have some poems about death and dying. And this one is maybe a little lighter treatment of that. Anyone who's lived in an apartment where you maybe don't have control over what's happening in all the spaces around you um, 
maybe you've experienced something dying in your walls and having no way to uh, to deal with that. So this is called the dead thing. Life cycle of the animal, very apparent in this. The dead thing. Oh, effluvium of rat corpse, odor of mouse droppings, funk from deceased bird, niff of decomposing squirrel, whiff of skunk. Everywhere, this smell of death, not a figurative sense of doom pervading every thought, but real. In every room, putrid rot, something has died in our ductwork. Oh, miasma of ancient raccoon jammed between joists, fetter of possum or mole, or maybe the neighbor's lost cat. The stink corrals us in a single room we seal, infuse with incense, windows open to morning mist and autumn chill. For the first time since our girl was a baby, the three of us bed down and nest together, the creaks and midnight stirrings of one nudging us all in and out of uncomfortable sleep. The perfume of our night sweat mingles, a bouquet of hot breath that fogs the vanity. Like a new litter, we weave together until we wake cranky and confined yet knit tight against invading scent. Oh, nothing lasts, good or bad. So come, time. Come, you houseflies and scavengers, you insects, mites, beetles, larvae, maggots, and worms. Do your work. And the last of the animal poems I think that I'll read um, has to do with birds. And also that way in which the whole world sometimes envelops you in whatever you're experiencing. When you're feeling grief, the, the world seems to grieve with you. Um, when you're feeling joy and lightness, I think that can happen too. So this is called Everything is a Sign Today. Feather in the grass, stippled and striped. Hawk, I think. And then a man blocking the sidewalk, child on his back, both of them pointing binoculars toward the treetop where I know a great horned owl nests, though I've never seen it. All these birds, creatures I might never have known had I not spent my childhood filling her feeders, naming each genus from our perch at her kitchen table. A falcon swoops down beside me on the path, gripping some rodent in its talons, twisting the body to kill. Like the time a heron, a few feet from our picnic blanket, plucked a whole mouse from its burrow and swept away. She had been delighted, said we too should grab something special of our own that day. Turning toward home, I bend to collect a wrinkled postcard at the curb, an advertisement for the Monet exhibit. How I loved those paintings when I was younger, all of them nearly the same. Haystack, haystack, haystack. The only difference, the season and time of day, which is to say they are like this grief these months later, all the same, but for the light. So it's not all animal poems in this book. Um, there's a series in the middle of high bun, which is a form I really loved occupying um, when I was writing a little bit about the challenges and joys of parenting a teenager. I found in the form, which is a little bit of prose followed by a haiku, a lot of tension that spoke to some of the tensions that I was interested in trying to write about and record. Um, so I have a series that really came very quickly to me all at once while I was experiencing it. And then I really haven't written a high bun again. Um, so this is called High Bun on the Ides of March. I guess it's worth mentioning I'm a high school English teacher, um, which finds its way into my work a lot. I think I have references to every text I've ever had to teach. So for those of us teaching Shakespeare to juniors, um, the reference to the Ides of March um, and to Julius Caesar might feel pretty familiar. So High Bun on the Ides of March. The Ides of March have come 
but not gone. And we are in the car on the way to school. The girl is crying again, cannot catch her breath or remember how or why, only that she is angry and I am the problem. There are times these days I wish for something impossibly dramatic, a piano or anvil to disgorge itself from sky perhaps and land beside us rather than continue this infinity of quarrel. Who won't listen or love? Who doesn't understand? Who can't be bothered to pick up her socks from the living room floor? Who is this child beside me railing against each word, hurling insults until I too begin to weep. You are horrible, she says. I hate you. And it's not as if I hold my tongue laced more with pain than poison. We are a wild primal thing. I want to fling myself from the car. She wants to fling me from the car, but we both need me to keep my hands on the wheel steady in traffic, ignoring glances from drivers to our left and right. This is none of their business. Listen, I am no Caesar, need no lifelong crown. To say a girl must overthrow her mother to make her way as a woman is absurd. Yet, as she winds up again in fresh attack, you never, you always, I can't stand. I wonder if she'd thrill to see me conquered on the marble stair or maybe just this dashboard so she can rise to rule her own Octavius. Crow feather and strife, so common, we learn to praise, not to bury them. One of the things that I find so useful in the haibun is the little haiku at the end, which becomes almost a gesture to nature, some place to put some of those bigger feelings. And although the haibun are um, mostly concerned with tension, I think there is one sort of lighter one that I thought I would um, also incorporate today. It's called haibun in the middle of the night. Though she knows better, the girl still says nightmare a relic of early language when she also said flea mingos and girled cheese, night mere as if to belittle, merely at night, merely a vision and not some charging lathered mare galloping through dreams to tear and divot the fragile terrain of sleep with roughshod hooves. She holds on to this verbal tick and I, my mother's ear, which hears her steps outside our room past 2 a.m., her tall 13-year-old body filling the door frame and a whimper of explanation, nightmare. And so she log rolls between us, stiff at first, no longer familiar with the sensation of family bed, sleeping between the two bodies that in joy made hers. Soon she curls toward fetal, her body's twitches, a metronome to better dreams, her mind shifting to work that can't be done in the waking world. She rolls toward me, slings an arm around my waist and sighs. Moonbright, surf roar, and this rare touch, I can't sleep from such delight. And I'll close tonight by going back to the bees and the bee world um, with two final bee poems. One, um, again, sort of revisiting the idea of illness or of the ways in which um, the hive itself decays, the body decays. Um, this opens the section of the book that deals with grief and illness and it's called Collapse. What do bees want? is a question I've never asked myself or any expert. I know they need to gather pollen and nectar, need water and shelter, though they can make their own of any hollow place. But as to want, who can say? I say I need to take my vitamins, apply sunscreen, eat greens and exercise, want self-care, 
something I deserve for what I do not know. Our bodies are built to decay. I opened the hive only as often as I was told to check brood the health of the queen. I did not know what I was looking for, but trusted diligence would keep us from disaster. They wanted me out of their way, so I closed it all up, left them to their own desires. And this last poem I'm going to read for my friend Nick, who's here um, from Chicago, one of the joys of Zoom, I suppose, although I miss the opportunity to be in person, certainly with that dynamic reading that opened tonight, but also to know all of you. Um, and maybe to get my book signed. I really miss that about readings. Um, but this is a, at the end of the, the book. Um, and Nick was texting me last night to, to sort of notice the ways in which, um, as the book goes on, I end up more and more alone. Or the speaker in the poem sort of ends, um, as we all do, maybe a little in the end uh, alone. So this is called After Swarm. As for when my first bees knit themselves together in a single sovereign self and slunk over the fence in search of their truant queen, I couldn't say, not with my own house to mind. They could have been gone for weeks when I noticed the hive grave still and empty of their chance. By then a thing inside me some rotten cell had broken off too, though I didn't yet know it was sliding through a dark body system, the same stealth path as swarm, a channel not meant to be traced by eye or die until arrival, seething growth suspended low. Though I looked, I didn't find my missing bees, a fist of them dangling from a neighbor's tree, excised from the world, their hive left full of labor, I couldn't call them home. What an easy harvest, my first. No need to leave honey so bees could overwinter, measuring enough for me, enough for them. I cut wax caps from cell tops, spun out every drop, and took it all. Now this last jar, all grit and crystal with age, it's time to order a new batch of bees for spring, clean the moldy hive brought down from rafters, and brush out my veil. I will be alive this time to what swells and roils the colony, the first cluster gathering on the fence line. I will heed. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was really wonderful. Thank you all for being here today too. And don't forget to purchase these wonderful books by our three writers. Um, now we're going to hear Kathleen Ossop. Kathleen Ossop's most recent book of poems, July, was published this year. She is also the author of The Do-Over, which was a New York Times editor's choice, The Cold War, which was one of Publishers Weekly's best books of 2011, The Search Engine, selected by Derek Walcott for the American Poetry Review Honickman First Book Prize, and Cinephrastics, a chapbook of movie poems. Her poems have appeared widely in such publications as The Washington Post, The Best American Poetry, The Best American Magazine Writing, New York Review of Books, The Nation, The New Republic, The Believer, Poetry, Paris Review, and many others. She has received a fellowship from the New York Foundation for the Arts, and she has been a fellow at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. She teaches at the New School and at Princeton University. In her groundbreaking and most politicized collection, Kathleen Ossop takes a hard look at the USA as it now stands. She meditates on our various responses to our country, whether ironic, infantile, righteous, or defeated. Her diction is both high and low, her tone both elegant and straightforward. There are poems based on bumper stickers, the names of churches, little shops. 
traveling tests for her beliefs, and Asap fully discloses her doubts and confusions. Asap is an unconventional, mighty magician with words. In her review in the Harvard Crimson, Eleanor B. Powell writes, Asap's expert use of motherhood as a lens through which to view America is refreshing and deeply affecting. She admirably and honestly recounts her feelings of jealousy, protection, and fear for her daughter in a way reminiscent of Joan Didion's reflections in her seminal prose work, The Year of Magical Thinking. Please help me welcome beloved teacher of so many HVWC students, Kathleen Ossop. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you for having me here today. And uh, Jordan, thank, Jordan and Amanda, thank you for letting me read with you. It was a real pleasure to hear your poems, and I'll certainly be looking out for more of them. Um, so I am going to read from my book, but I wanted to start with this poem that actually I did used to teach at the Hudson Valley Writers Center. And um, this first poem I want to read comes out of one of those classes. Um, and anyone who knows the room where those classes take place might recognize it. Um, so this exercise that I gave this class was to sit and write um, a description of the room we were in. And I let it, I, the main point of the exercise is for it to go on too long. So that I think it was like a half hour just sitting and writing descriptions of this one room. And um, I don't usually do exercises that I give in class, but I did do that one. And um, I guess the point was to discover what's there after you think everything's been discovered. Uh, and so maybe if you know the Hudson Valley Writers Center, maybe this will help you imagine that we are there in person. Um, and the poem is called Henry Hudson. Wood is a masculine substance. Witness the arts and crafts movement, the men at the helm of it. Witness for that matter, this room. Oak floor, oak walls, oaken ceiling. The air conditioning grate, ersatz oak the slats of the ceiling fan, oak veneer. The table I write on, particle board, with no pretense to oak, oak sad cousin. And the craftsman style light fixtures, triangles, right angles, dreamed up in the minds of geometers. What does geometry illuminate? I'm the sad cousin of a mind. The arts and craftsmen were reacting against Victorian furbelows, the ornamental empire, or as they might have said, civilization. Still, this room is only the sad cousin of nature. It has its smoke alarm, its water cooler, its green exit sign, a threat, not an invitation, its lectern, its monumental fireplace of unpolished granite, its coffee maker. Out the west facing window, I see flat and small as a playing card, the platinum slice of river and beyond the wiry cliffs of the Palisades. The sun is setting, pronounces Henry Hudson, eternally facing west, bobbling on the deck of the Havaman. So I should have said the Havaman is the half moon Henry Hudson's boat, that's its name in Dutch. Um, okay, so I'm go first going to read the very first poem in my book, and then I'm going to read from the central, long kind of diary poem about a road trip that I took with my daughter, um, but we'll get to that in a minute. This first, I want to sort of pave the way with this first poem in the book, which is called Go. 
It is a cube, it is red, it is mountainous, it is a bird of fire, it is the bones of the pelvis, it is a walnut, it is treasured. It is yellow Saturn wobbling in its orbit, it is danger squawking. It is the desire to sit down with strangers in cafes, and then it is the strangers in cafes. It is the man with the black t-shirt labeled unarmed civilian, and it is the unseeing man with him and his painful trembling. Always it is oxygen and more oxygen. It is the fight in you and the fight in you dying. It is the need for water and the water that falls from the sky. It is desperate for a theory and it is the acts you call evil when you know that inside evil is always desperation. It is bravery, arrogance, purpose. It is the pink morning and your smile in the pink morning. It is a phantom in the thin neck of a tree. It is a little project called loving the world. It is howling in the dirt. It is an extravaganza. It's the abandoned sports bra in the dirt besides howling you. It's the wind chimes in the thin neck tree and it is tongue tied. It is asleep. It is waking up now. It is a small cat on the bed. It is the threads of a leaf and it is the three graces splendor, mirth, and good cheer. It is their heartfelt advice. You can't let it hurt you. You must let it hurt you. It is a careless error in the hotel pool blue with chemistry. It's a kiss, of course it is a kiss. It's an old strange book newly acquired but not yet cataloged, it is crazy. It is you crazy with honesty and crazy with ambition. It's the sun that stuns over and over again. It's your tablet, which is every tablet everywhere. It's an explosion. It is every explosion everywhere. It is pavement, mineral, and hot and wet with droplets. It's the stars that pitch white needles into the pond. It is provable. It is a lotion. It is a lie. It's a baby because everyone is a baby. It talks to you, always to you. It moves swiftly, it is stuck. It moves swiftly, it is stuck. It moves swip, swiftly. It's the impenetrable truth now clear as ice. It is serious, it is irreversible. It is going, going. It is flying now, flying, strong enough to know anything. So the title, thank you. <laughs> Uh, the title poem of my book, July, is, like I said, it's a poem, a diary style poem about a road trip that I took with my daughter um, in July of 2016. So I don't know if that rings the bell that particular month, but it was a pretty infernal month. It was very hot everywhere we went. And um, the political, the presidential conventions and campaigns were going on during that month. And um, there was a, what the news media seemed to call a violent incident, like every day, literally every day. And so all of that is in the poem. It is in the form of a diary. And um, so every piece of the poem has the date on, you know, as kind of a subtitle. So the poem is called July. <clears throat> July 4th. This is before we leave on the road trip, by the way, July 4th. July 4th, independence is an outmoded, even dangerous concept, but the three of us go see the fireworks on the river, the chrysanthemum, the peony, the one that fizzles like fresh ginger ale. Our white independence leaves dogs trembling under chairs and other consequences. July 9th. I should say too that inter interwoven with the kind of nar diary narrative of what we're seeing and doing and thinking and feeling. Um, there are standalone poems too that have separate titles. So here's one, July 9th, on giving birth. That night I was full of information.
Okay, so our idea for this trip, this was the summer before my daughter went to college, um, was to drive from the northernmost point in the continental United States to the southernmost point. And in order to do that, it's the northernmost point is in Minnesota, but in order to get to it, you have to drive through Canada for a little bit and then come back to Minnesota. So, and the place where that is the northernmost point is called Angle Inlet. Um, this is July 11th. To get to Angle Inlet, the true northernmost part of our journey, we drive through woods, coniferous, mostly sky. We have to cross into Canada for about four miles, then cross back into the US. The smiling white Canadian border agent, hello ladies, what brings you to Canada today? We outline our quixotic purpose. Okay gals, have a great time. He explains that we have to call into US customs when we get to Jim's corner, then proceed to Angle Inlet, then call into Canadian customs on our return. We're the only two nations in the world that allow customs by phone. US and Mexico don't do that, he says proudly. Jim's Corner. I'd pictured a sort of general store where the call to customs would be made homespun by donuts and interesting hardware and Jim. Instead, a muddy corner lot with a rotary phone handset. When we get out of the car, we're targeted by flying insects as conscious as birds. On our way, we'd seen birds like ravens who'd been working out at the gym. Angle Inlet, a flock of white pelicans loiter wearily in the water near the shore. A caretaker, a white man, drives up in a truck and throws them some fish. Immediate frenzy, displays of aggression, slapping wings, expansion of their sullen mouth pouches. The drawing of a pelican in my mother's prayer book pricking her own breast with her long pointed beak so that her starving babies could drink her blood, a symbol of Jesus who shed his blood to save us and oh, the maternal martyrdom. OED app tells me, John Skelton wrote, then said the pelican, when my birds be slain, with my blood I them revive. Scripture doth record, the same did our Lord, and rose from death to live. We're staying the night in Roseau. Don't tread on me flag, husky trotting alongside of road. Oh well, can't see everything. Cleansing wave gospel church, Jesus really loves us. I'd rather be a conservative nut job than a liberal with no nuts and no job. Bumper sticker on Pelican Feeder's truck. July 13th, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She always frays when she gets too hungry and we ate a late small breakfast and skipped lunch. By five o'clock, she was frantic and too hungry to eat and she wouldn't say yes to the Falls Overlook Cafe, although we were right there. She found her phone, she found on her phone an expensive restaurant downtown. I lost it and shouted that it'd be half an hour before we got there she sat down, ordered, and got food there. Shame. She'd been nursing like a champ, said the doula, from her first moments in the world. When they turned out the lights in my room, I allowed a nurse to take her to the nursery, baby kennel, Rob said. An hour later, the nurse came back and woke me up. Your baby's crying. Do you want to feed her? No, give her a bottle. The sun had been in my eyes all day, stinging them even behind sunglasses, along with the melting sunscreen, and by eight o'clock it was still aggressive as noon. I felt attacked, wanted to attack the nearest vulnerable thing. Guns, gold, and rock and roll. A Corvette convention in town, the downtown streets closed off and lined with Corvettes. The owners strolled past and sat at outdoor tables drinking beer, the guys, and wine, the wives. They're mostly in their 60s, white, prosperous looking in an unpleasant way. Prosperity that has abdicated responsibility, smug was my interpretation. Their phallic substitutes looked cute and slightly threatening as if they might spurt any minute. 
Still, I wouldn't ride a mind, mind a ride in a Corvette. Enjoy the highest speed limit so far today, 80 miles per hour. I push to 90, the distance is so distant and the road there so flat and foreshortened. We saw cults, but Muri called them ponies. Didn't I teach her the difference when she was seven? What else haven't I taught her? In Falls Park, we watched a mother duck and a duckling get what seemed to us too close to the edge of the falls. The water, water rushed furiously around them and it seemed impossible that the duckling wouldn't be swept over. The mother was unconcerned, turning away from the duckling, often hot, diving into the water for plants or fish. The baby was so tiny, but held its own and made its way into a little hollow in the rocks and the mother followed. We moved to sit in the cool grass in the shade of an evergreen with long lethal needles. Then a police car drove into the parking lot not far from where we were sitting. Muri clutched my hand. One of them's getting out his gun. I couldn't see sun and eyes, and I couldn't honestly tell her the fear was irrational. Where are they going? They're talking to a man who's sitting on the path. He's naked. Let's go. Should have said my daughter's name is Muriel and we call her Muri. Um, here's one of the standalone poems. It's called Political Poem and it's um, t-shirts, made up of t-shirts. Political Poem. Cool story, babe, now shut up and make me a sandwich. Take a mental picture. Keep calm and carry. I love Canadian boobies. Crowns are always in style. Hashtag smile. Save the hooters, breast cancer awareness. Pugs, not drugs. In dog beers, I've only had one. Respect all, fear none. Like a boss, God only knows. Goal driven. This is the part where I nod and act like I'm listening. Pardon my French. Thank God I'm fresh. Don't laugh, it's your girlfriend's shirt. Ain't nobody got time for that. Daddy's little Hoosier. Just a Texas girl in a Georgia world. Irma Gerd. Trying to get star spangled hammered. I don't get drunk, I get awesome. Got freedom? Collect and destroy. Go fuck your selfie. Today, hike in the lost hills. Not lost, not lust. Curving yellow path through the crisp dry green grass. View like the sound of music, which we sing in cheesy opera voices. Girl with dark pony trail on the trail, striding ahead of me into her future. Hello. I give her dominion. Over the yellow orange moth, I give her dominion. Over the thistle, I give her dominion. Over the hills, I give her dominion. Over the armies of men, I give her dominion. Because she is gentle, I give her dominion. Um, I guess, let's see. July 21st, Panama City, Florida. The latest shooting in North Miami, where we'll be in a few days, black caretaker of a black autistic man lying on street next to him with hands raised, shot in the leg by a Latino cop. I thought he wouldn't shoot me if I was on the ground with my hands raised. Wow, was I wrong. Video, why do you, why do you shoot me? I don't know. Trump gave his acceptance speech tonight, introduced by Ivanka. Years ago, he said if she weren't his daughter, he'd date her, and I understood why Dante had to write his Inferno. Lifeway Ministry, you're worth it. Sunset boat ride, we watch dolphins leap modestly out of the bay to inhale, exhale. We stand at the ship's front rail, I'm king of the world style. Muri sees a cute guy, edges away from me. Later, the sky turned an electrified coral lavender with big crazed horizontal shards of lightning splitting it. I had a flash of the old woman I'll be someday, a little elegant, a little dotty, a little inward, a little quick to touch people's hands. A saint is someone who absorbs hatred and doesn't pass it on. Gators, melons, gator jerky, hot boiled peanuts, t-shirts. 
and better wrap this up. Um, two more bits. July 25th, Key West, Florida, which was our destination, the southernmost point. Posh town with a mac mask of slackerdom. Someone made the money, who and how. Bernie addressing the DNC now. Muri says they all sound so fake. There's whiskey in the jar, Confederate flag on the car. Walk to southernmost point, waves slapped the embankment and we slapped the concrete buoy monument, made it. We produ produced by far the most progressive platform in the history of the Democratic Party, says Bernie. I am proud to stand with her. Here's a standalone poem called On Gender. I said to Muri over Key Lime Pie that we need more feminine energy and power to challenge the patriarchy. Feminine meant Bernie. She disagreed. She doesn't think anything is gendered. I modified nurturing energy instead of dominating energy. Then she could agree. Our mothers always a mystery to daughters. I don't want to be. And this is um, the last day, the um, trip home. July 27th, Key West, Miami to New York. ISIS knife attack in a church in France, shooting at a teen club in Fort Myers, shooting in Munich. This is a standalone poem, short one called Motherhood. A pineapple is grandma to a porcupine. A candle is grandma to a pair of wax lips. Each thing gives birth to something more vivid than itself, and so on. Stopped at a Starbucks on the way to the airport. Yes, corporate devil, but it's that or Waffle House. Had to make a U-turn. Gospel song on radio. Jesus is with me when I need him most. You are leaving Key West, Paradise, USA. Nothing feels like what it's supposed to feel like. And this is the last bit, the, um, close to the last bit. It's a standalone poem called The Perfect Day. Every penetrating warm eye that is, is thrilled. Uproarious August other, uncommercial splashing, fizz water wet and spilled on me, the cloud heap, and we can like the swell. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was wonderful. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Sophia, for spotlighting all three of them so quickly so we can do our Q&A with the readers. Um, since we have so many Hudson Valley Writers Center students here today, and many of them are working on their first full-length collections, maybe we could um, ask each of you to talk a little bit about your process in putting together a book of poems and what you would recommend as the most salient things to remember um, when you're especially putting together your first book. Anyone? <laughs> oh, oh, we could start? Oh, I think so. Right. so first off, so thanks. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, Thank you, Kathleen and Amanda, for this was such a dope reading. Um, so that's a very big question. Um, first and foremost, I my book was mainly conceived in my MFA program, so it's like basically my thesis, and um, I started writing it in like in 2016. And I think like I didn't really finish it until maybe um, last year when I submitted it for the prize and everything, and so actually this year wait oh my god it came out this year sorry zoom brain so what i would say honestly is that at first i was just compiling a bunch of poems saying okay whatever poem i write is going to form a book but it wasn't until like later on i really started thinking about okay what do i really want to say in this book like um when i first started out i had a different ideas of what i wanted the collection to be one of the ideas which i eventually became what the book is now is that i want to write a book of ekphrastic poetry 
um, about like my family relationships and dynamics. And at first, um, my mentor um, wasn't a huge fan of it. She's like, oh, no. But then that same summer, after that, sa- that summer, I wrote this poem, Dive, after Kendrick Lamar. And she read it and it's like, you know what, definitely go along with this project. And so honestly, it's just me grabbing poems and pulling them. I had an outside reader, um, Natalie Diaz, read the book and she was like, you know what, you got something going here, but it's not really working. And so I went back, started trimming and started revising again. And then as I kept going throughout the years, I started thinking, okay, what I want to say. And as I kept going, I started thinking, this is a book that's meant to be about my um, father and his illness and like our relationship. And at first I had in mind, I was gonna write a book and I was trying to figure out how to organize it. But I felt that one thing that helped me really organize the collection was when I started to think of it less of as a book and more of like as a double LP. Like, you know, like kind of like the double LP Songs in the Key of Life by Stevie Wonder. Um, that's like one of the big inspirations for the book. How does a side one and a side two. And another inspiration for the book was The Man Who Sold the World by David Bowie. But like the first part is like in um first person and the second part is like in second person perspective. And once I started thinking of it more of like an album and as like a music project, I started thinking about, okay, how poems communicate with each other, how to like, you know what, address different perspectives of a theme. And then the book just came together. So like, um, the gist of what I'm trying to say is, you know what, take your time to write the book. Also frequently take different classes if you can. Like, you know, if you're taking a Hudson Valley Writer Center class in the right track, I was still classed with 92Y, MFA program, um, Brooklyn Poets. I did um, Poets House back when they were so operational. Like, go everywhere, and then you might find some people that you like in those groups, and then you say, you know what? I want to form a workshop with those people on the side. I've done that too. Basically, you pull from everything, and also trust your gut and trust your obsessions, because I feel like this book would have come to be without me thinking of, you know what, Songs in the Key of Life. The Man Who Sold the World, and even the book um, Lead Belly by Tahim Bajess was a big inspiration too, and the way that he, like, you know what, used um, song lyrics to, like, kind of, like, book and different sections and anything. So, yeah. I like that you say, trust your obsessions, because I think I've been writing B poems for 20 years and and really thought that they were part of a separate manuscript. Jennifer mentioned that I had been submitting two chapbooks. I, I had this real sense that the older work and B work and early motherhood poems were really separate from illness poems and grief poems. And so I felt like I was working on two or three manuscripts for a long time and I didn't really know what I was doing. It just had a mass of poems. And then um, I was working with Amy Nazuka Matatal and she said something to me about, well, you know, beehives collapse. There's, there's a way in which these poems that you feel are much later in your life, they still fit together. And she gave me that sort of central idea that like, oh wait, I could actually be looking thematically at, at work and start pulling it together. And it really all of a sudden galvanized me and it made it very easy to, lose dozens and dozens of poems and and really hone and refine around the structure, the shape. And once I found that it happened very quickly for being someone who wrote for years and years alone, 20 years alone, um, I found that shape and that that sort of sense in 2019 and the book got picked up very quickly after I found its home in a lot of ways. So I don't know if I have that much to add. I think like Jordan and Amanda really covered the important things. Um, I guess I'd just say like, listen to yourself, listen to where your your poems want to go, what they want to be surrounded by um, in in the context of a book, a collection of poems. And um, What you, I think Jordan, you said, take your time, which uh, yes, definitely. But then I'd add like, don't take too much time <laughs> because um, I, I know poets who just um, never quite trust that their work is done. And I feel like if you have a bulk of poems that you're happy with, it's probably a book, you know? It, it, um, it came out of your consciousness it's, um, you know, a single consciousness and, and probably those poems belong together. Um, and 
after that, I guess, um, I think both of you talked about having other people read your manuscript, which is indispensable. And because, well, at least for me, I, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty confident about writing individual poems, but I can't see, I can't see the forest for the trees. So I really rely on readers to help me with my manuscripts and tell me like what, what doesn't belong or if ordering is an issue or yeah. So I think that I, I guess, you know, you hear people say, Oh, write the poems you want to read. And I would, since I was a book lover before I was a poetry lover, um, I would say, write the book you want to read too. And um, if you can do that. Then, then I think um, others are going to want to read it too. Well, I remember saying I was working on one of my books and I said, like, I can't imagine who's going to want to read this. <laughs> and um, a friend said to me, well, you're a person and you want to read it. So probably other people will want to read it. And I think it's good to keep that in mind, too, because you can get so, you know, into it um, that you can't see that it. Um, that it has value for other people too, sometimes. Thank you so much for all of those insights into the process of shaping a collection. Um, I'm, I'm wondering now if we could talk a little bit more about this topic that Jordan mentioned of how critical it is to trust your obsessions. And I'm wondering when you, you know, whether or not you're in a space of shaping um, a particular collection, what it looks like for you to trust and nurture your obsessions, and if that is maybe a different process or the same process as nurturing your uh, craft as a poet. I think there are steps in the same process anyway, that um, I, I actually believe that there is no good poem that doesn't come out of a poet's obsession um, in some sense anyway. And so it's not, you wanna spend time with your obsession and, and with me especially, I tend to be obsessed with things I don't understand completely or at all. And so writing the poems and crafting the poems is a way of um, spending time in that uncertainty or lack of understanding. And it's something I want to be doing. Like um, I'd be doing it in my head if I weren't doing it in language. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. I think for me too, there's a um, there's a way in which when I was obsessed with the B poems, that became an obsession with poetry too. I read them now, and I see that I'm also writing about poetry very much, and and I'm currently deeply obsessed with the ocean to an almost annoying degree that every time I sit down and I think I'm writing a poem about one thing, here comes the ocean again, here comes dawn again. I just can't seem to escape those things, and so having to lean into that and figure out why. Am I being drawn here? And how can I empty that well, or at least get to the bottom of it? I think that's really been important for me, both from just an obsession standpoint, but also about craft too. I must have a reason that that's pulling me and obsessing me. And I think by leaning into it and not resisting it, I find these new levels of craft too, that I have to uncover to really get at why it keeps coming up. Oh God, I gotta go last. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I but yeah. Um, like definitely, I feel like what Kathleen said. If I wasn't obsessively, I wasn't using language as a way to chart my obsessions. I'd probably be doing it in my head all day, every day. And um, as of late, my current obsession has been like um, duality in a way. And I've been like really focused on writing persona poems and in response to like you know what. Um, video game antagonists or film antagonists and all that because I don't know it's, it's like 
I spent so much time with the first collection, the chapbook, writing like confessional poetry, you know, in response to like music. Cause like, I feel like it wasn't for like music and like video games or like media. Like they offer like me a gate, they offer a gateway for me to like dive into like much heavier stuff for me. Like I couldn't flat out write a poem saying like, this is how I feel about that. I'd have to go like, oh, you know what? I was watching so-and-so and then like this got me here. Like for example, the other day I wrote a poem literally where I started mulling over why I have, I'm having writer's block as I was watching um, Leprechaun in the Hood. You know, that Leprechaun in the Hood film? Like it's like, a, it's a horror silly, it's about a Leprechaun, you know, Warwick Davis plays a Leprechaun, stuff like that. So anyway, I feel my obsessions, at least my obsession with um, persona and duality and um, mediums help, media helps me, you know, best talk about things I can't talk about otherwise and it's like I said before you have to trust your obsessions because it may seem like it's nothing to you however like Kathleen said just because you think no one's going to read it remember if you're interested in it somebody's going to want to read it and that's the gist of it oh I'm done you can you can ask another question <laughs> I just, it's so weird. I have all these eyes on me like, no, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much um, to all three of you about that. Um, very interesting ideas about writing into your obsessions. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Maybe if you could let us know what you're working on right now um, or in general or in specific, how, however you want to answer that question. Okay, I'm ready. I got this one. I got this one. Um, all right, start up. So my full length collection came out in March of this year. Chapbook came out in August. I'm trying to get more readings to happen. Um, I'm also flirting with the idea of possibly going for my PhD in English with a creative dissertation or PhD in creative writing. I'm also kind of flirting with the at least starting the idea of like writing a young adult novel and everything. Because oddly enough. I've transitioned from genres all the time. Like I started out as a slam poet. Actually, no wait, growing up it was fiction, moved to slam poetry. Then I moved back to fiction. Then I moved back to poetry. And I kind of, I kind of have like a lot of ideas in my head for like different projects. So I definitely think right now, maybe a young adult novel is in the works maybe, you know, God willing, me willing, I don't know. But, um, and I'm also, flirting with the idea of writing a diff another collection about another collection of persona poems from the perspective of um video game film video game film and maybe like comic antagonists in a way so yeah like i i'm all over the place it's like i have so much as much different energy and vibrations like as many different obsessions it's like oh i gotta do this i gotta do this i gotta do that so hopefully it all works out or you know if the phd thing doesn't work out because i may decide you know what i'm burned out because I have two master's degrees. I have an MFA in creative writing literature. I also have a master's in special education grades one to six. I may be kind of burnt. I got that last one literally last September, so I might be kind of burned out right now. But PhD seems like it's highly likely. If that doesn't work out, maybe a fellowship or a residency. I don't know. Like I, it's like I have so much energy. And like if I don't, if I'm not in like a school building and all that, like you know, with a PhD or I'm not like you know doing a residency and all that, it's hard for me to channel it because I get like very distracted and I get really my down periods I get like writer block periods so hopefully this works out and also I'd like to do a bit more readings maybe you know it's like I like doing this this is fun to me and, you know and I miss doing it in person but zoom hasn't been too bad because like I like to move a lot and I like to perform a lot so yeah sorry I rambled but yeah that's like that's where my mind works like so many different energies and ideas coming out but yeah that's it so what I seem to be obsessed with these days is injustice <laughs> and there's like ample, ample food for that obsession. And I'm writing a lot of very angry poems. And I, I guess I should have said about putting a manuscript together for me anyway, there's a period of time where I don't see the book in the poem. I write writing poems, but I don't see the book or feel is a more accurate way to say it. I don't feel the book yet. Um, 
and I'm kind of in that period right now, but I am writing a lot of poems. They are extremely angry and um, maybe that's what the book is going to end up being, or maybe it'll be a chapbook. Maybe it'll be a section of a book. I'm not, not entirely sure, but that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time being angry and writing poems about it. I'm, I'm not sharing the angry space with you, but I am sharing the space of having a lot of poems and not quite knowing if it's a book yet, but I definitely am working with a lot of ocean and climate poems and, and really actually just enjoying not having a collection or an idea of it and allowing myself to wander through what's pulling me right now. And I'm also translating for the first time. So there's a Costa Rican poet named Ana Istaru whose work I'm, I've been carrying around with me since the 90s when I discovered her while studying abroad. So I'm working on that as another way to get at language and um, experimenting with some lyric essays too. There's a couple of prosy pieces I found releasing myself from line breaks at a certain point in composing poetry to be really liberating. So I'm working on those as well. Thank you all so much. Thank you for this wonderful reading. Thank you to the audience. We really loved hearing the three of you together today. And it was interesting how there were so many themes um, of daughterhood, motherhood, um, coming together in three very different ways in, in your work. So um, I love the way your, your poems spoke to each other. We're going to save the chat so all of you can have it and and if you haven't seen some of the things people have been saying to you and thanking you and quoting your lines back to you um and i hope that um all of you will join us next month um when we have a prose reading on december 1st on zoom um and then we have uh two more poetry readings and then that will be it for the the end of 2021 so we're thrilled to have you all here today. Thank you so much to the poets. Please don't forget to buy their books. Um, Kathy's uh, Press and Jordan's Press have offered discounts. So this week, um, please look at the Hudson Valley Writers Center website and this event page for the details of that. Sophia will also be sending you the link for that tomorrow um, when she thanks you all for being here. So thank you all, and we'll see you back here again soon. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Amanda. Congratulations on your wonderful collections. Oops. Sorry. Thank you, Jennifer. It was great to spend time with everyone. Thanks, Thank both. you all.